Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to EY. It's a, a really enthusiastic bunch of faces I see before me. Um, so uh, welcome and thank you for your time this afternoon and, and also to those who have joined us online. It's like mission control up here trying to get everyone um, organised, but hopefully you can hear us all okay um, online there. Um, my name is Mark Galvin. I'm a partner in the firm and I um, lead program evaluation services for Oceana. Um, but before we dive into the program, I would just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people um, on whose land we are meeting today. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, um, and also extending um, that acknowledgement to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room or on the call today. Um, so as I've said, um, it's great to see you all. I think we, we had over about 500 registrations, so there are a lot of people online, I believe, um, for this event. And that reflects the um, importance of this topic and a topic that is topical in terms of um, uh, approaches to evaluation and measuring outcomes in place-based settings. Um, it's also a testament to our fantastic panel of speakers, um, and I'm really looking forward to their insights uh, this afternoon, but also the hard work that's been put into making this event happen by um, Melissa and Paula, um, AES Simna and the team uh, that, that are behind um, the setup today. Um, and just a very quick note on housekeeping. Obviously, you, you know where the exits are because you came through them, but uh, next to the lifts, there are exits. There will be a, a, a warden in place in the unlikely event of, of an emergency, and you can take directions from the floor warden from there. The bathrooms are past the lifts and to the left and down the corridor. Um, hopefully, you can find those easily enough. And after the session today, drinks will be served um, outside in the evening room outside. Um, and with that, I would like to hand to my colleague, Mel. Apologies. We are navigating many different technical, um, it's a bit like climbing that rock. <laughs> um, so, as I was just saying, uh, we were just talking through Simna and AES. So, Simna has been established to help organisations and their stakeholders understand social impact through education, knowledge sharing and networking, like today's session. Um, and Paula is my co-host today, and Paula is Chair of Sydney's um, Simna Committee. Um, I am a member of the AES New South Wales. Um, we are a member-based organisation and we exist to improve theory, practice and use of evaluation for people who are involved in evaluation or interested in evaluation. <clears throat> we have more than a thousand members involved in all aspects of evaluation and performance measurement and we deliver a range of training to our members and those with an evaluation interest. Um, once per year, we come together as a SIMNA and AES collaboration and run these events. They've been happening for a few years now and we're really excited to be having this conversation today and sharing it with all of you. Um, we are focused today on place-based approaches and thinking about place-based approaches, it was quite interesting even as a panel, we had a lot of debate amongst ourselves around what, what a place-based initiative actually is. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing from some diverse speakers today, and I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Leanne Moloney, who is from Clear Horizons Consulting. So Leanne's here. Leanne is Director of Consulting and a partner at Clear Horizon. She's a consultant. Sorry, anyone on the line, if I can ask you to stay on mute. Um, she's a consultant who specialises in measurement and evaluation and learning. And for over five years, Clear Horizon has supported the development of approaches for evaluating place-based initiatives and have worked with a wide range of organisations and initiatives to design and implement fit-for-purpose evaluations. Leanne's been supporting government and non-government organisations in the environmental sector to bring place-based evaluative thinking to their delivery teams. And we're really looking forward to hearing about some of that experience today. So thank you for joining us, Leanne. We have George Argus. George is Head of Measurement, Evaluation and Learning at Paul Ramsey Foundation and he supports the Foundation's mission to, to break cycles of disadvantage. George has worked within the university sector for many years, teaching research and statistics and publishing many articles on evidence-based decision -making. making. He's also worked for several high-level government evaluation frameworks and informed those, including the first New South Wales evaluation guidelines, which I'm sure many of us in this room have worked with over the years and currently um, is working with the Australian 
of ACT. I'm sorry, everyone online, can I please ask you to stay mute? It was in the purple. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a technical. <laughs> and is currently working with the ACT government to build a whole of government evaluation capabilities. And we have Rachel Bertram in the room as well. Rachel's a social impact and evaluation specialist who's based at UTS. She's co-founder of the UTS Social Impact Toolbox, which is a project that's aimed at enabling access to social impact evaluation, education and resources. She works across sectors, building capability of organisations to plan, evaluate and report on the social impact of their work. Rachel's also currently undertaking a PhD and in the last stages of that PhD process, with a focus on how one measures success and what defines a thriving community. So we're really looking forward to hearing from experiences from George and Rachel on the panel today too. Um, we also have on the line Anna, and at some point I will manage, I will figure out how to get Anna to be up on the screen. Um, let me just stop my screen share so that we can show you Anna to the rest of the room. So Anna, are you there? Mm. Okay, people online can see Anna, um, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Anna is the CEO of Collaboration for Impact, and Anna sadly um, her flight was cancelled, so she was unable to be here today in person. But we're really looking forward to hearing from her. Collaboration for Impact is a national non-profit organisation that enables people and organisations to transform systems through collaboration. They work with a range of Australian-wide communities, government and funders and other collaborators to build capability, social infrastructure and collective influence for systems change. And is leading the design and establishment of the National Centre for Place-Based Collaboration um, and working with communities, government, philanthropic, human services and other enabling organisations to design <coughs> the national infrastructure required to tackle complex challenges through place. Um, and I think I've um, briefly mentioned our co-hosts for today, so Paula. Um, Paula's a social researcher with experience in evaluation, public policy and social impact. Um, she leads program evaluation services and evidence-based projects within the Department of Regional New South Wales. And as I mentioned, is also a chair of Sydney's Sydney Organising Committee. Um, and myself, I'm Melissa. For those of you who haven't met me before, it's really lovely to meet you all. I'm a director in EY's evaluation practice, um, but also with my other hat on, I'm one of the members of the New South Wales Australian Evaluation Society's organising committee. Um, as I mentioned, we do these events once a year. We're really excited to have this conversation and it's really great to have you all here, both in the room and on the line to join us. So as I um, referenced earlier, it might relieve some of you to know that despite the level of familiarity that we, um, our panel has with place-based initiatives, there was a lot of debate amongst ourselves over many months as we were planning for this event around what a place-based initiative looks like and what measurement in place-based initiatives looks like. Um, I'd like to open today's session by inviting George to talk a little bit about some working definitions of place-based initiatives to help us to frame today's conversation. Um, now, George, I will flick through the slides for you if the oh. clicker's not working, so uh, let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that, Melissa. Um, yeah, we, we, we want to get past the debates about definition so <laughs> and move on to a more important discussion. So just to have a working de definition to start with, and this is borrowed from Just Start and at, um, Clear Horizon and the work they've done, that has some of the broad characteristics that are consistent. Words like collaboration, words like partnership jump out at you, um, shared accountability, uh, involvement in communities, um, there's some of the elements that you'll see in various different definitions of place-based approaches. Now, I'm trying to be a bit more concrete with that. Um, there's sort of, I've developed two archetypes of what a place-based approach might look like and what it involves. Um, so if you want to jump to the next one. Oh, so again, some common characteristics of, before I get to those archetypes. I won't read out each of these. Um, they're there on the screen and we'll provide these slides to you at the end so, so you have these notes. Um, just a couple of things that are worth talking about um, in relation to the characteristics here. One thing I've, I've learned when doing place-based work 
is not to conflate the community with the place. The ter two terms are often used interchangeably, inter and they, but there's a difference. There's things that attach to a geographic region that are separate from the communities that live in it. And secondly, when you talk about place, you really talk about the community. It's only in very specific places where there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. It's often talk about communities, plural, in a single place. And that open up, opens up a lot of issues that flow into evaluation and measurement in terms of relationship between those communities, potential conflict, disagreements, different values, traditions, all of that comes into play when you think about places distinct from the communities that live in that place. So I'll just flag that because it's something that, that might come up in the later discussion for you. Um, Happy if there's any points up there you want me to expand on now. I think just I noting we can't see online. I think there we go. It's up. Yeah, Thank it's up you. Ta. Um, we'll jump. Happy with that. If there's unless there's some a point up there that people uh, go into a bit more depth now. Um, can I just confirm that everyone can see the slides online? Um, so thank you, George, for setting that scene. Um, Anna, I wondered if you wanted to add a little bit more there from your perspective. Given that we did have a lot of debate in the lead up, um, based on what George has just said, do you have other thoughts? Is there other um, evidence that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about place-based? What does that actually look like to you and to the team that you work with? Hmm. Um, on the spot, Melissa, straight into it. So, um, and hi everyone, it's wonderful to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, look, I, not so much difference, actually more around, often we look at this as spectrums as well. Um, so, and it might come in one of the later slides, but there's some great work that's been done actually by a number of researchers. There's a, um, and so it's been adapted by the Victorian government in terms of their place-based framework that really looks at a spectrum of working on place through the place-based change. So I think there's some helpful distinctions we can make across that spectrum about, you know, whether we're being um, focusing a particular service on a particular cohort in place, all the way through to you know, a community-led collaborative approach that recognises all parts of the system need to come in behind some of the complex challenges. So. I think for the purpose of today, we're probably talking more about that end of the spectrum that's looking at multi-stakeholder collaborations um, that are really genuinely um, informed by the context of place and led by place. Um, but just to note, there's differences and we need all of it. Um, just the evaluation and leadership practices look different across that. Thanks, Anna. Um, and Leanne, I wondered if you wanted to share an example of one of the initiatives that you've worked with, and as we said at the outset, you've worked with a number of different place-based community-led initiatives, mm -hmm. just to help to contextualise for all of us in the room who, and for those who may not have been involved in a place-based initiative, what that looked like in practice. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Now, I yeah. actually didn't work on it. Sorry. I actually haven't worked on this one, but it was um, considered a good example just because I think it just, um, it's, um, people can just generally understand it. Um, I've actually got some points that you could share if you wanted to just now. Um, but it's in um, it's a it's a place based social initiative, and that's the interesting thing. I was just having a chat with Brian before is that for some reason most of the place based initiatives that we're seeing are in the social sectors, not in the environmental sectors. Even though the environment, um, the environmental um, you know um, discipline discipline of, of environmental science is very much around um, systems thinking and and thinking about ecosystems and so forth. So. But um, this one's in Northern Mallee region of Victoria. Um, and, sorry, that's, uh, next one. that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. next one. Next, uh, this one. You want me to give that? Hey, yeah, there you go. Mallee. Hands up, Mallee. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Northern Mallee region of Victoria, and it's um, addressing the social issues being experienced in the region. Um, and it's around improving the health and wellbeing outcomes for children um, and their families. Um, so this this region, the, the Mildura LTA, um, experiences you know, high levels of um, socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, there's um, high levels of high rates of family violence, um, children on child, child protection orders and in and out of home care. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of strengths in that community as well, which are being um, leveraged through this approach. But um, Hands Up Mallee or HUM, as it's called, 
um, works in partnership with those who understand the needs of the community best. Um, so obviously community and sales, service providers and agencies um, to identify where action investment needs to be made or we have the most impact and then um, very strong collaboration, evidence, evidence informed decision making um, and including obviously um, local community knowledge in that in that evidence um, about the services and intervention. So they've got a, um, in, there was a large consultation period, um, very, very extensive. I think 300 people were engaged in that consultation um, over a 12 month period um, and they've come up with a um, community aspiration. So the vision, it's a little bit hard to read there, but connected communities, families. Um, mm, sorry, I can't quite read that. Matter. Matter, families matter, sorry, and children thrive. So this vision, it's very much a, a shared a shared approach, which is one of the characteristics that George spoke about earlier, um, place approaches. Um, has a focus on prevention and early intervention, and um, they have different, um, the, the, the way the approach works is it looks at um, different, I suppose, cohorts, you could call them, um, very, very young, zero to eight years, so best start to life, young people matter, and so forth. So Range of different programs uh, within that broader approach, targeting those those cohorts. Um, Clear Eyes, not myself personally, but my colleagues um, in Clear Eyes have been involved in uh, designing the theory of change, or they actually call the journey of change, um, for the for the, um, for the for the entire Hands Up Valley and a monetary evaluation and learning framework, um, but also tested um, journeys of change and and Mel plans. For different aspects of the programs, um, some evaluation of the evaluation of capability building and support and mentoring and coaching um, for the uh, to do their own good evaluation work. Excellent. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and Anna, I believe that there's an example that you'd like to share as well. And I'm just going to flick back on the slides. Please let me know if you can't see those. Um, can you? Yeah. Yeah. And you can hear me, okay? We can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Actually, Melissa, if we've got another 30 seconds, I'd love to share the slide before that as well. I think, um, the one that has a pink in it. Yeah. That's that it. Works. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Just that that's, you know, um, to what I spoke to earlier, there's a number of spectrums out there. We find this quite helpful in just locating the conversation we're having. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, to give an example, which, you know, I want to talk about a multi-site, so multi-community example of place-based change that really looks at what can be addressed locally within the boundaries of geographic place, but also recognises there are other system issues that intersect into place that need to be addressed as well. So I'll talk to an example in a moment, but just thought it might be helpful just to also place this a bit more in the why. Um, so why, you know, why we're seeing such a, um, an uptake in place-based change, inc incredible increased investment in place-based change, and really off the back of many years, in fact, some people would tell, you know, um, Aboriginal colleagues would tell me this has been happening for many, many generations. Um, communities leading change, and more recently, we're really learning into what are those different models and how we can better align resources behind it. And the reason why that's important is because more and more we're recognising that programmatic approaches just aren't working for the type of complex challenges that we have across communities and across our country and really the world. Um, now, no one I think is saying that place-based change is the magic bullet, but it's a really, really important part of the equation when we look at models of change for addressing some of those complex and entrenched challenges. Um, and so I think where we're talking here, particularly around place-based change, is really, as I was saying before, about recognising we need all sectors to be collaborating um, together, aligning the resources that we do have behind a shared agenda. Um, and where we're seeing more traction, more um, impact and early signs of really systemic change is where those efforts are really galvanising community to the point where community have the agency, the um, governance structures, the practice, the resourcing to lead that change. So what we're not talking about down that blue end of place-based change is community, it's not just community development, and it's not just communities coming up with a whole list of priorities. Um, it's really quite sophisticated um, models where we're you know, lining lots of different institutions and actors behind um, 
those community priorities. And it's often it's data informed and it takes many, many years to really establish the practice and conditions around it. Um, so with that, I might go into the next to the example. Um, this might be familiar. I just had a quick look at who's online. So definitely familiar to some people. Um, stronger places, stronger people is one of our um, really important demonstration initiatives across the country. It's working in 10 communities across the state. Um, just checking sounds working okay. Yeah. Um, so it's working across 10 communities that are at different stages from establishment right through to scaling. So as Le Leanne talked about with Hands Up Mally, the wonderful folks in Mildura um, have partnered with Stronger Places, Stronger People for a number of years. Many of you will know of Bernie Works, Logan Together. Um, so what's, I guess, there's other examples of multi-site place-based initiatives as well, including Victorian um, community revitalization working in seven communities across Victoria, um, looking at really quite significant community-led um, reform and change in regards to economic outcomes. So Stronger Places, Stronger People, um, it is really looking at ways of testing the model for um, community-led systems change. Some core principles in there, um, and every, every community does this in their own way. Um, but what is core and common are the principles that are being worked to, both by communities, but also um, all levels of government that partner with each community and other funders, including philanthropy um, and then any other collaborators that come on board with those partnerships. So those principles include you know, the recognition that we need systems leadership at all levels, at the local, state, regional, right through to national level. Um, that we another principle around shared leadership and decision making. Um, so recognizing that these big complex challenges do require the um, not just one single actor to address them. Um, we need shared decision making behind the community priorities. Often the work that starts is data informed learning around what are the community It sound like an interesting conversation. Um, <laughs> so, um, so shared leadership and decision making is another principle, particularly centering First Nations leadership and self-determination in the change process. Um, community mobilisation and leadership, so more than just, you know, engaging people to set the agenda, it's ongoing mobilisation around the change agenda um, and having community, diverse representation of community at the heart of that. Again, that looks different in different contexts, but it's really critical when we start looking at the how and why of evaluation of place-based change in those contexts. Um, as I mentioned before, another principle of aligning resources behind a shared agenda for change. Now, when you think about that across multiple sites, communities, contexts, and across multiple scales, it opens really interesting and challenging questions around how we think about MEL in these multi-site initiatives. Um, and really critical, if, particularly if we're looking at um, large scale change where we can't just address that by putting all the pressure onto communities to address that um, type of ambition that's needed. Um, so if you genuinely believe that we need all parts of the system to collaborate around it, we need to be looking at all parts of the system in terms of our learning and evaluation as well. Um, so maybe something we can pick up later. I know you're nudging me to the next one. So this is an example within there, which is the Barclay Regional Deal. Um, big shout out to these folks who've done some beautiful work on crafting their shared agenda, which manifests in a theory of change, which is the slide before and we could probably share it out later. Um, this, this is, yeah. Um, there's so the theory of change, which um, they've also art articulated their how, so their way of working. Um, talks about the different types of levels of governance, the working groups, um, and importantly, the principles that hold this work together. So in addition to the activities, in addition to their priorities and their work streams, it's the principles that become almost the DNA for how the Barclay Regional Deal um, enacts the change across multiple stakeholders and scales. Um, so they've done some really interesting work there in that last slide around a rubric that looks at 
what those principles look like across different phases of time as well and what good looks like for that. And so really in interesting, important piece of work when we think about principles-based evaluation. So a few headlines there from Barclay and SPSP. Mel, we'll need you to unmute the room. <laughs> perfect. Can you thanks. all hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so I was just trying to thank you for that, Anna, um, and thanks for those great um, examples of rubrics and other ways that we can map some of and consider some of the change in the outcomes that are driven by place-based approaches. Um, Rachel, I wondered in your experience how place-based approaches change the dynamics and the power dynamics within a program and within monitoring and evaluation. Power and agency is a really interesting thing. It's kind of woven through what I've said uh, this morning already because by the definition um, that we spoke to earlier, place-based initiatives are a democratisation of power in how we discuss community, how we engage with what's important. Um, and evaluation, my practice, is a process where we say this thing is important, this thing is worthy of value, this thing is worth our time, our energy, our money, our resources, uh, our energy, if we are volunteers in community, maybe not money, if you're from the not profit or volunteer area of town. Um, and so power plays a really interesting point when we look at who has a mic. That as well. Who are we allowing to speak when? Um, and so place-based approaches are an opportunity for multi-stakeholders, as you mentioned before, but the people that know place best um, to speak to what is going to work for them, what is meaningful for them, um, what are the challenges of that area and of that place. And as Leanne mentioned earlier, uh, you can't extricate the social from the political, the economic, the environmental, because everything within place operates in relationship to each other. And so that's why, as was so beautifully articulated in those examples, um, we need to understand what is happening in relation to people, place, time, um, and power dynamics in order to understand how change is going to occur. And so the process of systems evaluation, the process of place-based evaluation, is really delving in and examining that. And to do that, you have to have time. You have to allow community to discern what's important to them. And then you actually have to listen and invest in it, which is kind of the part of the puzzle that historically has not been done very well. We're very good at listening, but now with the investment in the Nexus Centre, in this uh, movement towards acknowledging the relevance of local place-based knowledge through things like Indigenous knowledge systems, um, traditional ecological knowledge, but also just people on the ground doing the work, people that are facing those challenges every day, um, it's a redistribution of that power. Uh, the other thing that I will say is, and it was alluded to as well earlier, is there is a spectrum. And it's very easy to be swayed towards where funding is talking about this now, which is around large scale systems level change, which is really important to engage with. But if you also want some good examples of where it's done well, have a look at your local youth centres. Have a look at your um, community engaged resource groups that are in place have been doing this for eons. Um, place based initiatives are just initiatives that are reflective and responsive to the communities that they're in. And then we get the fun of going in and unpacking what that actually looks like, how it works, and interrogating it, which uh, we're going to do next in this conversation. Thank you. This has been a really good uh, introduction and definition. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for the panelists so far. Um, so, yeah, so this second part of the discussion, we are going to focus on evaluation and measure, measuring the social impact of place-based of place -based initiatives. So evaluating uh, place-based approach is very complex because of the diverse of uh, players, different levels of work, the long-term interactions that you have to have with individuals, the dynamic nature of the activities and outcomes, and the attribution aspect as well. Um, so with so many moving parts, it's very difficult to design a one-size-fits-all evaluation model for place-based approach. Um, so my first question now, so what we would like to understand a bit more now is what is different or unique about place-based initiatives um, compared to other programs? So I might start that with Anna that is online. So first question for you, Anna. Right. 
Thank you. Um, now I have a slide for this. Is that possible to get it up here? Yeah, me too. We will give it a shot while you keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. Because um, I understand my job here is to sort of set the scene for what is different and challenging um, about evaluation in the context of place-based change. And I think it's fair to say that many of us have been on this journey for quite a while, um, figuring out how evaluation can best serve place-based change agendas, particularly community agendas in that. Um, so it's been a, a whole heap of learning and cycling around um, and huge progress made as well. I think it's fair to say that um, we're almost, I think evaluators are applying their own practice of learning through this as well. And here's a bit why I'm trying to slow down before we get the slide up. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll keep going. So um, some of the key characteristics, and then I'm going to hand over to the evaluation experts actually in the room. Um, so some of the key characteristics of place-based change, this is of that particular part of the spectrum. Again, I'm, I think just to not, we don't need to talk about the whole spectrum, just that particular part around the um, collaborative place-based change um, models. So that they're complex and multi-layered um, and they're long-term, ideally long-term interventions. Um, so we're talking, this is generational change. You know, a number of the initiatives that you saw on the map I shared and more than you go know, for more than 10 years um, in their current form. Um, so that's versus being programmatic. So we're not in the territory of cause and effect logic models. We've smashed that out when we're talking about this type of place based change. Sure, there are some projects in there that within sort of the context of a place based initiative, there might be some projects that lend themselves more to that cause and effect programmatic evaluation. But as a whole, we're talking about something that's much more complex. Um, and with that is another characteristic, you know, they're highly emergent and developmental. Um, we used to say particularly in the early stages, but actually it's the way it is. Um, as we all know, just the way the world works, um, there are some things that are known and some things that are unknown. So, you know, what do we think, how do we think about evaluation serving a context that's highly developmental and emergent? You know, it's where some of the thinking around developmental evaluation has really had some traction. Um, most communities we work with and speak to really value the learning part of MEL much more than the M and the E part, for example. Um, it's often, as I mentioned, it's often across scales, um, different scales for different initiatives, but we want to be thinking about how we understand progress and learning, not just of the work that's happening locally and in community. You know, a, a wonderful community that's um, there's some really mature work with their systems change. Um, so looking at, well, how do we understand the role of government as, a, as an actor, as a player, as a partner in their initiative? Um, and how do we start to yeah, tell more of that story as well? Um, it's also the intersection of multiple systems when we're talking place. I mean, that's why we're talking about place. It's the place in which um, we all, as citizens, experience the intersection of systems and particularly in place based change, it's about where those systems are inequitable um, and not serving everyone. So that in itself lends its, um, leads to a different type of evaluation considerations when we're talking about um, yeah, intersecting systems and complex challenges. Um, multiple stakeholders, and that also relates to both um, what we're wanting to be tracking, but also relates to multiple stakeholders will bring multiple expectations and needs of place-based, of, um, of mail as well. Um, different stakeholders will value different types of data, will require different types of reporting still. Um, these are some of the sort of upstream challenges that we're looking to address um, that start to relieve some of the pressure, particularly on the communities and the backbones that are holding this work. Um, but we still are in a context where often communities even they do have quite good funding and partnerships around them, are spending a whole lot of time managing up and reporting up with different reporting templates and tools, different types of data being asked for. And sometimes those reports aren't even necessarily, and I can say this, um, not necessarily having to yeah, informing the work they're doing in community. They're purely for reporting purposes. I think, you know, we're starting to be conversations about how do we actually think about data, reimagine data differently, where it does serve um, our needs and actually genuinely informs decision making. 
Um, a couple of other things, so really important principles of data sovereignty. There's some great work happening in the place-based change field around Indigenous data sovereignty um, and networks forming around the learning that, of that and, then, and frameworks as well. Um, and this might be a good segue to George. Um, so more than the sum of the parts. So we want to be um, understanding not just the sum of the different initiatives, working groups, um, and, and infrastructure pieces, we're looking to also understand that connective tissue that comes through place-based change. Um, and as I think someone else said before, really important consideration in place is we are looking at the rewiring of power relationships. It's really tricky to evaluate that and understand the progress of it. Um, but different communities will, will value different types of power shifts as well in that highly contextual at times too. Um, so I might just stop there around some of the characteristics. Um, maybe the next slide. Just yep. quickly. Thanks, Anna. Is just quickly, George, do you want to have a yeah. say on that? Um, yeah, that idea of more of a, given the title of the, of the presentation about outcomes. I think it's really important in place-based initiatives to define some set of outcomes that is more than just an aggregation of outcomes that sit at the individual within the place. Take community resilience, for example. Obviously, community resilience at a, for a place is better if all the individuals within that place are more resilient. But there's aspects to community resilience that don't just sit at the individual level and that place. Yeah, when I did disaster recovery work in Queensland, one of the Queensland communities that was affected by Cyclone Debbie, they learned that if they trained the hairdressers and the barbers and the people at the front desk of the post office to listen out when they're doing their work for people who are in need after a disaster who are adversely affected and feed that information back to the relevant groups, they can address those pockets of real extreme need after the disaster that traditional approaches don't get to. And that's an example of, so no individual is more resilient place was. And so thinking about that idea of the parts, the whole being more than the parts, uh, and defining outcomes that capture that, I think is really important to the way place place in Okay, thank you. Thanks, George. Um, now I just want to talk about what are the approaches used to evaluate place space initiatives. And I'm just going to start with Rachel. Um, Rachel, can you discuss some methods you have used or come across in place space initiatives? Sure. Um, I think you'll be relieved to hear that it's not particularly that novel. <laughs> um, the, the challenge with place based approaches is the unpacking, the understanding where are we going to be actioning things, where are we removing resources from, investing them, doing all that kind of Tetrising um, of things, a lot of mapping. And then when it comes to that point where we have that articulation, the processes are pretty simple. Um, the, all the students that we teach and the work that we do every year, yes, a lot of it, people really rest with that mapping. And that's where we rely on the expertise of groups like New Horizon, Collaboration for Impact, because that is the value offering that they can give now. So when we start to look at the role that we as evaluators play, that consultants play, that government plays and policy plays, that is also a recalibration that we have to start accepting and to go, if we are going to be engaging from a grassroots perspective, what then becomes our role, our leaders? And it's shifting now more to that listening, facilitation, coordination um, in order to then get to that point where we have a really clear articulation of what success looks like. And then we start bringing in all the practices that we know as evaluators around good research methods, ethical conduct and research. Um, where there is a bit of a trend now in terms of how we're engaging um, is not new as well because it is, a, it is the approaches that First Nations communities have been doing around the world ever since communities started to evolve, which is effective listening. That's <laughs> what it really comes down to is are we actually listening to what um, communities want? Are we listening to what is happening at the intersection between the different components that mentioned earlier? We can have a discrete outcome community resilience, you know, connected communities is a really big one that we see now, but what the heck does it actually mean? 
This is why we have frameworks and theories of change that go into all the different nodes and modules that we then build out into cave frameworks for to go. This is how we're going to understand resilience. This is how we're going to go and measure um, community cohesion, right? Or we come up with a standardized metric for it. And we like that as evaluators because it gives us something that we can put into a report and give a number to. So there's comfort in that. Um, where we're starting to see the sector move towards is much more to what Anna was speaking to, what is understanding the relationship that is occurring within those nodes. And so there is a lot of really good literature out there that engages with Indigenous research methodologies, which now is being taken on by a Western Academy looking at complexity theory, systems thinking, um, looking at complexity analysis and understanding the relationship between those two. But if you read the literature in Indigenous standpoint theory, if you read the literature on relationally responsive evaluation, you start to see how we can go understand about understanding the patterns that are occurring there. That's where we're starting to move towards. That's where we start to see a lot of qualitative, again, mixed methods approaches. But then also the people that we're speaking to going back to power still really like numbers. And so matching the two, because if I was to go to community and say, we're just going to do what you want to do, and then we're going to operate in a bubble, that doesn't allow them to speak to power holders and allow that redistribution to occur because everyone's a bit, everyone's a bit on edge. And so as a whole, and this is why these communal approaches and these collective approaches are really impactful, is it's allowing everyone to maybe speak different languages, but you're getting the best of all of the worlds. And so the skill that we have to have as evaluators, as community facilitators, in managing these processes is how do we bring everybody along in that conversation and enable us to then go, all right, well, we're going to use this really cool statistical analysis method that George is going to speak to in a sec. Um, <laughs> or we're going to look at this really cool relationally standpoint, um, relational standpoint approach. That's what's most appropriate to this community. We don't have to speak to government because we've got funding from this other person that's really on board. So understanding the politics and the connections is really important in how we design out our approaches and what methods we're using. But once we get to that point, they're very kind of standard approaches to how we go about and methods to how we go about measuring that little thing, which we can speak to in um, at length if you go into research methods. Um, but I think George has an example that he was going to share. Yeah, I was going to ask Leanne about something first before we go to the very funky example that Joe is going to give us. Because <laughs> um, Leanne is going to talk about place-based evaluation framework. Um, then we have something on uh, the presentation as well. Thank you. Go. Great, thanks. So um, uh, George mentioned this when he um, put the definition up. So the place-based evaluation framework I'm talking about here is not the place-based evaluation framework. It, it's one of, I mentioned several, um, but it was produced in 2018 um, by Kira County Director Dr. Jess Dart uh, in collaboration with a bunch of people in the past. I think over 150 people were involved in its development. Um, like all good framework, it's important to be clear on what the purpose is. It's about providing guidance um, to how to evaluate place-based approaches. Um, it's about clarifying the different types of outcomes that you might expect to see, um, relationships to power dynamics being one of them. Um, across um, different phases of place-based approaches and also, really importantly, guidance um, and capacity building for those implementing place-based solutions to their own good um, measurement evaluation and learning. Um, so this framework is free and publicly available. It's online, so and we've got some resource um, links at the end that we'll share with you. Yeah, it's included in there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, most people are familiar with this definition or this adopted definition of evaluation from, from Michael Quinn Patton in 1997. Um, the framework uses the, the uh, adaptive version of that definition, systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of place-based approaches. So we're definitely talking about characteristics as well as outcomes um, to make judgments about the approach, improve the effectiveness, and inform decisions about future activities. And going back to some of the uh, features that Anna was mentioning that make place-based approaches unique or different in relation to how you might approach them from an evaluation perspective. Um, evaluation here means many different forms and many different forms of evaluation being used at different times for different purposes. Um, so it includes forming evaluation, includes somebody impact evaluation for tracking change and causality and importantly developmental evaluation um, for informing the development of the place-based approach. So I'm just going to quickly share with you the, um, the actual 
framework in a nutshell. Um, it's got a few sections. Um, evaluation principles um, to guide the general approach to evaluation. Um, planning steps, um, helping you step through um, and uh, the design of a evaluation framework, well planned framework for your approach, um, and it recommends recommends phase specific evaluation um, plans because different phases have different requirements. Um, there's also really long time frames associated with phase based approaches. Um, there's a neat little visual in there that helps you sort of conceptualise it if you're a visual person. Um, a lot of people love that that visual um, and generic theory of change, um, which talks to um, the typical types of um, levels of change you might expect to see um, in place-based approaches, and also what you might, what changes you might see, see along the way in terms of changes in the system, including relationships, power dynamics, um, policies, practices, um, mindset shifts, and so forth. Um, and if anyone's familiar with systems evaluation, system thinking, they recognise those sorts of typical conditions for systems change. Um, a set of um, evaluation questions, a lot, which is not normally recommended, but of course these are picking and choosing um, across four criteria and operating at different levels and types of change throughout the initiative and a toolkit. So along with the framework, there's a um, toolkit to help you actually step through the process. Evaluation plan. The... Um, yeah, I think maybe. Yeah. Yes. I have I short. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. So, yeah, but recommend get online and have a look at the generic um, theory of change model for um, place based approaches um, has been really well received by a lot of people. A lot of people uh, really like the ability for that uh, model to help them frame the thinking of how change happens. So, Interestingly, just recently doing uh, helping an organisation um, rewrite an evaluation report, they're trying to explain their initiative. And um, I shared this with them and they got really, really excited. They said, we've never thought about that's exactly how we work. We haven't thought about that. We can't articulate it like that. And now we can. And so that's been a, a, just a really winning moment. Thank you. An impactful example, isn't it, of how mm. place-based methods can actually drive and empower mm. change. Mm. Um, I wanted, Amber, if you wanted to field a couple of questions to us from the Zoom. I've seen that there's a number of questions coming through, um, and obviously we're really keen to cover some of those. So we've got Amber just joining them on the edge of the panel here. Just so that the microphone yeah. can pick me up. Yeah. So do you want to do the questions now or go to George? <laughs> yeah, go to George. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a question or a comment and a question. I really appreciate the point Anna made about the reporting and data collection burden placed on communities, especially when that data is not valuable for the community itself or informing decision making. Do any of the speakers have examples of using external data sets to measure outcomes or impact or reducing the reporting burden? Good question. That's a good question. Who would like to go first? Uh, yeah, I think there's always, you're going to use a multiple set of those um, and for example there's official data on a whole range of things uh, problem gambling uh, transport use um, recidivism health outcomes that you can always draw on to, to um, reduce the burden on the community so yeah when, when we talk about community led and community engagement with all of that doesn't mean that everything has to be from the community to use traditional secondary administrative data sources to reduce the burden on them. I'm at, just as a side point, I'm actually wary of the use of the term community-led. I was pulled up short when doing the cyclone duty evaluation in Queensland where the community said, we don't want to leave, we're not ready to leave. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why you're the government, you're here to do that for us. Um, so uh, I think we, that idea of staggered approach and engagement and capability building of all partners so that they can be involved in the way they want to be involved rather than automatically talking about the community I think it's important to that bit of a sidetrack to that question. Okay, another question is how do you support First Nations data sovereignty aspects in place-based approaches? And what resources do you suggest for First Nations people? Speak to um, there's some brilliant work coming out at the moment um, and a lot of reviews happening in that space. So the first kind of area that I encourage you to look at is the Indigenous Evaluation Framework that was launched 
well, I've lost a year of my life, so two years ago, I think now, um, where that was the starting point. It was the start of a conversation. And in that, I'd also recommend you go and have a look at some of the submissions that um, were made. Because in the submissions that are made towards any parliamentary inquiry, you get a lot of insight into what's actually happening on the ground in the community. And so you can see how people are engaging in it. Um, but there's, when we're looking at data sovereignty, um, it's to listen to the people that it affects. Is, is kind of go-to there. There are resources around um, data collection and data management that Premier and Cabinet are looking at at the moment, so there'll be a report coming out later in the year on that, so keep an eye out. Um, but also have a look at Indigenous research methodologies and how they engage in that space as well, because there's a lot that evaluation can learn um, from engaging with the way that research has engaged in this space, particularly um, such a sensitive area as data sovereignty, data access, data reclamation, um, but what was the first part of that question? The second part? There was two parts. Uh, the second part is about resources yeah. and the first part was about data sovereignty. Yeah. So one of the best books that I have read around how you can engage in um, digital research methods as well is a book by Sean Wilson called Researcher's Ceremony. I cannot recommend it highly. Um, if you're interested in looking at systems thinking and new paradigms of how we engage with evaluation, but also just thinking, Tyson Yakupov's book Centaur is a brilliant read. It's also just a really fun read. Um, so there's some really wonderful work that's out there. If you're interested in the intersection between science ecology, so I'm sure to be right up your alley, Liam, um, but also Indigenous wisdom and Indigenous spirituality, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimura is another beautiful book. Um, and so there's a lot that we can learn from resources outside of the normal evaluation that we engage with, because there's a very dominant narrative in that space. Um, and the areas that, that community leaders are speaking into, they're using the access points that they have. Um, so for a lot of Indigenous people where the academy may not be welcoming them, the government may not be welcoming them, popular discourse is. And so starting to do a lot of reading, explore what's out there, go to panels like this, listen to people when they're speaking, you can learn a lot about what resources are out there. Um, but those would be kind of three starting points, but also like the ethical frameworks for Indigenous research and all that other stuff that's already online. On the toolbox, we do have a short list of guidelines um, relevant to who, uh, what community demographic you're, you're engaging with. So I encourage you to go and have a look at the short list of resources there. Um, and if you find any, do share them with us because they're, they're proliferating quite a lot. I know the AES also just launched their cultural safety um, earlier this year. Um, so have a look at that. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, there, there is. So this is, I'm kind of combining two here. How do you establish trust and transparency with the communities before the evaluation? And how do you ensure diversity and equity in place-based evaluation? I wonder if we want to throw to Anna first. Um, Anna, did you want to comment on that one? <coughs> Happy to. Um, there's actually a couple of other threads that I can kind of bring into this one too. Um, first of all, a shout out to COA Collaboration, um, First Nations owned and led evaluation um, group, not for profit. Um, highly recommend looking at some of their resources too and the practices that they use. Um, I think, so it kind of relates a bit to George's point about community led, which I fully agree with. Um, in that I think sometimes our language is a little clunky or we're still finding it as a field, aren't we? Um, community led can sound a bit like um, community led <laughs> rather than the collaborative um, change that we actually are, communities are calling for. That every, um, every group, every actor takes their part and um, shifts their part of the system to create more equity, more equitable systems and more equitable communities in particular. So I think is that with that lens that we need to understand that what the progress we're making towards more equitable communities, we need to be looking and looking at different parts of the system. Um, so there's some learning happening in Stronger Places, Stronger People is an example. The other one I talked about around the multi-site initiative in Victoria, we're starting to understand um, the different um, shifts that are happening at other institutions, including government around that. Um, the other part, I guess it goes to process um, that comes to mind when you think about equity. Communities that have really had time to lean into building relationships across different communities, and to George's point about the plurality of communities, 
um, particularly where they spend time on um, finding ways to share power and in some cases really genuinely centre Aboriginal First Nations leadership in their change agenda, which looks like really interesting intricate models of governance that can do that. And often, you know, by addressing the priorities of the Aboriginal community calling out, it's for whole of community as well. And folks in Mildura will talk about that quite a lot. Um, so it starts the equity question, how we think about um, diverse voices in the process of evaluation, understanding the outcomes they're contributing to, really comes off the back of the work that the backbone or the collaboration has been doing for many years to build those relationships across the community and with, across other enabling partners and collaborators as well. I'll just share one quick example of that, really practical. Um, the folks up in Burnie work, northwest Tasmania, um, worth having a look at their website. They did some really wonderful work over the last many years on annual learning um, circles. So they would talk to different collaborators, governments from all levels, um, service providers, people in the working groups, job active providers, schools, citizens around them, um, and ask what's different around here. Um, and they've been doing that for a number of years and they do it on those some of those principles I shared earlier. Um, the result of that and sort of the sort of muscle of learning over a number of years and the trust that's been built through doing that has been that in the last year when they asked again, they actually started with community and really diverse members of the community. Um, and as a community, they said, these are the types of changes we want to see here locally, but this is what we need from the decision makers outside community. And this is the kind of things we want you to commit to, to partner with us as a community. And so it was the threading of that then into a learning circle with other collaborators around. I was in a room with government funders, um, people who would normally be, you know, experience as traditional power holders, hearing what the community was saying, really sophisticated thoughts around data sharing, what good governance can look like, what good shared power looks like in the Bernie context. And we had at the end of that day, a number of really informed discussions around what those other collaborators can commit to um, with the community. So that in itself might not be outcomes measurement, but it is really critical strategic learning that does create some of the outcomes that they're looking for in community and in the wider system as well. So I think some great examples around process that goes to some of the equity. But my hunch is that Leanne will have some thoughts on this too, if I can put you on the spot. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Anna. No, I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about the different aspects of that question, um, in trust and transparency, the power dynamic stuff, um, and thinking about how, um, and there's a section, actually before this um, framework example I shared before jumps into the actual nuts and bolts of the framework, there's a whole there's small chapters, but a chapter on um, on involving community in the planning for, the design of, for example, the, the theory of change um, and, the, and the measurement plan, the evaluation plan, learning plan. Um, and so I was thinking about something that's a really practical tool, and you showed an example of this before under the rubric um, around the principles and what good looks like um, in terms of in terms of the levels of maturity with the soil and the seedling and the, and the sapling and then the tree. Um, and and ground zero, and so rubrics just in general, um, you know, highly relevant and useful um, in this context, but you know, also relevant more broadly. But the involvement of the people who who um, who matter really um, get to have a say, and and whose values get serviced through the process of co-designing those those rubrics in terms of describing um, what we expect to see at certain points on the journey. Um, and what good looks like from a, from a community perspective. And so that's a very, like rubrics are a tra really transparent way of describing how something is going to be um, judged or assessed. Um, and so that brings that diversity of voices in um, and is a super transparent way up front of describing what, what good looks like and the changes we expect to see along the way. So, um, really and, um, that's a really practical tool. And it's, mm -hmm. um, it was fantastic to see that example as well, mm -hmm. Anna. So thank you. Um, I know George, you use some really interesting methodologies from a statistical point of view in these cases, and we'd love to hear a little bit about some of those. Yeah, it's often thought that because of the intrinsic 
characteristics of a place it's so unusual that, it, that, that it's hard to make comparisons. You, you're almost obliged to use non-experimental methods to understand um, your impact and measure your outcome. And, and of course, they're always going to be relevant. But we've been, we've been using uh, a methodology called synthetic control modeling. I won't go into the technical details of it. Um, but basically, if it's agreed that certain quantitative outcomes are desirable, say problem gambling, and you're working in a place with a community to do something about problem gambling, it is possible to use this methodology to construct, it's not a real place, it's, that's why it's called synthetic, a mythical place that you can compare your real place to. It's done by using some weighted averages of other places that are similar to it. You could create a Frankenstein type of thing. <laughs> it's a counterfactual. So it's not a real place you're comparing it to, but through certain statistical procedures, it has some validity as a comparison. I mean, the archetypal example of it um, developed by the guy who used it is it's quintessentially a place based thing. So the, the illustration is what was the impact of German unification on the former West Germany's economic growth path? Definitely a place-based approach, definitely complex and everything that goes with it, but used it to show actually what's the obvious, which is its growth path was lower than it would have been had it not been obliged to take in its um, but, but as a method, it, um, it's, uh, we're, we're at the foundation, we're using it a lot more to look at and make some assessment, not of attribution, I don't think you could ever really attribute, not to decompose what aspects of what you did would work, but at an aggregate macro level, some sense that you have been able to shift the dial on some agreed quantitative measures. So like I said, uh, I wouldn't dismiss uh, quasi-experimental approaches, especially that one, when you're doing place-based work, but always alongside the um, non-experimental methods like contribution analysis that the Horizon did in Logan or other methods. Um, in the room, I'm really interested in questions. Um, I'm sure that many of you have been thinking as we've been talking about your own projects or your own work that you are delivering evaluation supports for. Um, any questions from the room? Things that you'd like for us to delve into a little bit more? Yes, there's a couple here from our AES colleagues. Um, I've been involved in place uh, based measures for three incidents, issues that um, I'm wondering how people deal with them. First is the question of social voting, um, and it's a government, it's particularly a government skill, um, in that uh, when it starts to get complex, uh, government departments tend to go running. Uh, basically, and they use um, the general conversation uh, not to involve themselves uh, in uh, initiatives. Um, the second issue is innovation uh, with overly complex community uh, initiatives. Innovation is a very difficult um, issue. Uh, in relation to that, and the third one, and they're probably all interrelated, is uh, long-term commitment. Uh, for example, and I'm sure Leanne and I were um, telling about this before the event, um, I think our involvement in natural resources, I think uh, one time there were three name changes of our government department in one year and eventually got to Department of Natural Resources, which everyone referred to as do not resuscitate. <laughs> so that probably links in with uh, social load. So I'm wondering whether the panel with people with the experience, how do you deal with that when you this uh, complexity? I, I might jump in quickly. I think that's where the not-for-profit sector and foundations like the Four Ramps Foundation. And I'm not speaking on behalf of the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Five years, just to make that clear. But we're, we're, foundations are in a, aren't restricted in that way by government. We're not, we're not siloed. We're not the Department of Transport and Dash Transport. We're not the Department of Health Does Health. We have the flexibility to work across areas and, and organise partnerships. 
partnerships and be in there for the longer term. So I think expecting it to be done by government probably the not the greatest starting point. Uh, and and where where foundations and other not for profits can probably maybe do a better job. Yeah, I can add to that. I think you said something really interesting around long term commitment challenge and one of the challenges with long term commitment is you need um, long term funding to be able to do that and that's where um, the the dynamic is changing because when you see um, a lot of collective impact systems based change a lot of these place based approaches require actors on the ground um, to be taking that initiative for parts people of that place to take ownership and lead it that still requires them to have resources um, and so if we're expecting five ten twenty year impact to occur for them to take that on board and run with it and really implement it to have those long-term system space changes we actually have to be funding it and that's where people start to really pull back and go well maybe not let's see how it goes and so it's it's a real dyna um, paradigm shift to thinking long term because we don't exist in cycles that operate long term so that's why commitment is a huge barrier to people because we're expecting people on six month, 12 month funding cycles to commit to things that take them five, 10 years. Um, and so we see highly responsive to where the funding is. We see funding chasing happening. Um, but the other challenge is now, and we go right back to the power conversation at the beginning, is when now every single funding round is focused on place based approaches, the pie is very, very small. And so, again, we have to see how we can bring on board our local grassroots volunteer organisations that carry a lot of the impact burden in the community anyway. And so when you look at these case studies um, that were shared today, a lot of the work is bringing out voices of the volunteers on the ground. Um, they burn out very quickly when we look at social change as well. So it is uh, the resourcing conversation is one that nobody particularly wants to have because it's sticky and it requires a lot of engagement. But to have long-term commitment, you've got to have long-term investment um, and you've got to empower people on the ground to do the work. And in many instances, it's giving them the resources and stepping back because then we end up in a situation where we have that repeating, well, we gave you all this money, but you've also got our data that we can put into our impact. So it's a deeper conversation. Again, stakeholder management and funding management as well is probably a chat later in another panel discussion. Um, but to enable long-term commitment, we have to be actually enabling organisations through resourcing. And Anna's got her actual hands up. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Just because I want to riff off that. I think that's right when we consider um, what kind of methods we use at different stages goes to what we need to expect at different stages as well. So if we assume these are long term initiatives, um, then, you know, I think actually, and I know a little bit more of Clear Horizons framework, and they do talk about some methods in there that are really suitable for some of those early stages. Um, Jess Dart talks about them like popcorn, wait for the popcorn to emerge. So I think, Leanne, there's something there around the outcomes harvesting. You know, I also want to do a shout out to some of the other foundations, including PRF, Dusseldorf Foundation, can also are leaning into other more, I guess, innovative practices because they can for evaluation. Um, so there's the story gathering project that Dusseldorf did, again, with Hands Up Mally and others, to start to say, well, how do we really get to the heart of the type of learning and data that's happening, recognising often the limitation of quantitative data, although we're all pragmatic and understand that we need to be able to work with, you know, different actors, the type of data that they need. So I guess, Lam, just wanted to see if there's anything around those early stages and methods that come there. Yeah, no, thanks, Anna. I'm just, um, I'm just thinking about um, that there's been so much, so much of the work that's been done in this space is happening through the foundations who can commit to these um, longer term, make these longer term commitments, not worry about election cycles and so forth. Um, it's interesting because we've got a couple of teams in Clear Horizon. One mainly works with government and that's the environment team. The social impact team mainly works not with government just because that's a, that's a nature where a lot of funding is coming from and a lot of the exciting work happening is by the foundation and the big NGOs that are putting a lot of that, that commitment in. Um, in my work, I've noticed so many organisations when you start talking to them about what they're trying to do and try to help them wrap a framework like this around it, have no idea that they need that they, in sort of average nine, ten years for we mm -hmm. see real, you know, some shifts of the dial. 
um, in, in the things they're trying to achieve. So, yeah, again, um, thanks for referencing that. And uh, it's just, um, I think, yeah, thinking about the methods that are appropriate for the different levels of change, which can be expected over different timeframes, is, is really appropriate. Yeah, another question in the room? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a community worker with Vinnie. Um, and <clears throat> we're developing the community side of things um, more as we, you know, we just have a community as well. And ways of doing it. One of my frustrations and questions is how you actually, you know, it's what you said, there's just the people on the ground. And community workers and uh, community members who, who uh, take ownership on that level, not on the you know, structural level, but on the growing and, and developing programs. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, understanding about how to do that. There is a thing called situational analysis. It's a very specific thing, but it's, it's part of that understanding the situation and the context. Um, it, Michael Quinn Patton talks about it in his book, uh, Developmental Evaluation, and Patricia Rogers has got some resources on betterevaluation.org. Um, so doing that, that situational analysis is, a, is the way to sort of try and address that issue. Yeah, but in terms of actually taking ownership of their community. Starting to get engaged. Yeah. 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 Um, I think one of the important things to acknowledge when we look at place-based approaches is that it doesn't discount what's already happening and it doesn't make the assumption that change isn't already happening in community. It's just how we're capturing it and uh, enabling it to scale. The other thing, saying that word scale, that I want to caveat is that we don't want to have the assumption that scale is a good thing because not everything is scalable. Oh, not everything should be scalable. And one of the challenges, particularly where you're on the ground, community workers, you're in the field, um, was working with an agency a couple of years ago, kind of before this language set was starting to percolate. Um, and they were giving a conference presentation or putting a pitch in for a conference presentation. And I was kind of coaching them on the language to use. And I'm like, oh, you're using the socio-ecological model of this or whatever. I'm just like, what the heck is that? And um, it's very easy for me as someone and the evaluators in the room that engage in this space, it's very easy for us to see it in that way. That doesn't mean that they're not engaging with that approach. It just means they don't have the language set to speak to the conference people that are reviewing the papers. If you don't have that language, you don't get visibility at the conference. You then don't get visibility to funders, to power holders, to their mobilised funding. And so the first step whenever I'm working with organisations is let's kind of get your skill set in speaking this to be able to speak to what you're doing currently. Other than reinventing the wheel and trying to get you to do some new innovative thing, it's how do we actually articulate what you're doing? And so starting to engage in that conversation, and George alluded to it before, these frameworks are much more invitational than other frameworks. Um, and so place-based approaches are invitational, but they can also be exclusionary um, because who gets invited to the table are the people that can speak the language. Um, and so the work we're doing at UTS, and particularly with the social impact toolbox, a lot of it is language. Because when you, you would see this when you go into community as well, you go, okay, well, tell us about your theory of change. And people gloss over and go, what the heck is that? And then you say, well, tell me what you do. And like, oh, well, you know, we set up this play group and then we realised that around a lot of grandparents were coming because they had a burden of taking care of the kids during the day and they were getting exhausted and they were isolated because the parents were having to work too much because their mortgages were going up. And you start to see this whole <laughs> thing happening and they can speak to that. But if you say, hey, map out your theory of change, here are some post-it notes, Totally disengaged. <laughs> so part of it, and this is where I spoke to earlier, what, what is our actual role as evaluators now? Um, one of the models that I really champion is the relationally responsive standpoint model, um, which is flipping the script on how we engage participation. Um, it's flipping the script on how we approach community, how we engage um, in community participation from an initial standpoint of respect and listening. And only once you've gone through that process can you get to taking action. So it's bringing people along through. So I advise go and have a read of that. Um, but one of the key barriers for organisations, particularly volunteer and small scale not profits that they face, is getting a seat at the table and getting in the ear of the funders um, because they don't speak the language. But oftentimes they have very big issues, which is why we invite them along to the table to speak at our place based. 
um, think tanks. Right? So it's getting everybody speaking the same language. And speaking of speaking, <laughs> I'm conscious that we are over time, but then we could speak all night on this topic, I'm sure. Um, for those of you in the room, we do have some networking refreshments and drinks and um, campaigns just outside, so we will move out there um, in the foyer to have those in a second. But please join me in thanking all of the panellists for such an inspiring <laughs>